All right, so we'll wait a little bit so that people can stream in. Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. I think we probably have the most people that we're gonna get. Um, okay, all right, welcome everybody. This is our, I think our fifth, fifth episode of this webinar series and um, it's been going super well and we're really happy with all of the different presenters that we've had so far. If this is your first time being on a green cover webinar, just know that your screen will be hidden and your microphone will be muted throughout the duration of the presentation, um, just so that we can focus all of our attention on our presenters for today. If you do happen to come up with any questions throughout the presentation, please utilize the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen there. And then at the end, um, we have a couple of people that will be answering those questions. So I will go ahead and turn it on over to Keith and he will be doing our introductions today. Yeah, great. Thank you, Sophie. And uh, thank you for putting all this together. It has been a, a really good uh, webinar series. So uh, my name is Keith Burns and I am the co-owner of Green Cover and the sales manager. And one of the great things that I've been able to do as part of my job and position here is I get to travel a lot, meet a lot of really neat people, experience a lot of pretty cool things. and. Uh, our presenter today, uh, Kelly Mulville, uh, I actually met Kelly uh, when he was in Colorado uh, working on some uh, ranches there in Colorado, and now he is at the Pacinas Ranch, uh, which is what you see in your background there, uh, which is in California. And, uh, you know, from the very first time I met Kelly in Colorado, I was very impressed not only with his, his knowledge of, of uh, sheep, but, but really more so the knowledge of how to integrate the livestock with the land. And that's, that's one of the things that's just always impressed me about Kelly is his ability to integrate both the livestock and the land and to manage it as an entire ecosystem and not just as a, a herd or a flock uh, separate from the ecosystem. And so uh, in moving to California, he's taken the concepts that he learned and he's integrated it even further into vineyards, uh, which is uh, maybe not necessarily unique, although I think Kelly is one of the, the guys that has done it the most and, and has some of the most experience. Uh, but it's really a great way to do it because now they're providing weed control and biological diversity in the grape vineyards. Uh, which, by the way, he said they're going to be starting uh, harvest tomorrow out there. So uh, pretty exciting. But so I'm really excited to have him share that knowledge and that experience with you of how they're managing everything holistically and how they're seeing benefits to both the animals as well as the vines and the entire ecosystem. So uh, I also want to introduce Davis Bailey. 
Uh, Davis is our salesman who has really grown into our orchard and vineyards expert. Uh, Davis has been out to the Pacinas Ranch a couple times. He's visited a lot of our customers in California, uh, specifically focusing on the vineyards and the orchards. And so we wanted to have Davis in on this webinar. He'll, he'll come back on at the end to help answer questions. He can share some other experiences with some of our other customers and clients uh, in that California area or, or in, in that same type of vineyard in a livestock integration space. So I wanted to introduce Davis. He'll be back. I will kind of moderate the Q&A session at the end. So yes, if you have questions, please, uh, like Sophie said, put them in that Q&A uh, box and we will get to those at the end. But for now, I am going to hide my video and my sound and turn it over to my friend, uh, Kelly Mulville. Kelly, take it away. Thanks, Keith. Um, thank you for having me on here. Um, I've, um, I've been following you guys for a long time now and you've been really influential in my work. Um, this first slide here is, is a, kind of an, a, a broad shot of Piscinus Ranch from the vineyard. And I just wanted to give a few basics. Um, the ranch is 7,600 acres. We're on the central coast of California about 60 miles inland from both Santa Cruz and Monterey. Um, we, the, uh, that mountain in the background, when the rains come from the coast, that stops it all. So we're in a very dry place. We've had about five inches of rain, two years running now. We're in a pretty serious drought, but our historic average is only about 12 inches. Um, this is a pretty historic vineyard, vine growing area, in that it's the second AVA, which is a, uh, which means it's a defined viticultural area. And it was the second one formed in California. There's vines across the road from us, basically next to the ranch that are, were planted in the um, mid to late 1800s that are still producing fruit. Um, there used to be a thousand acres of, of wine grapes on Piscinus Ranch historically for about 30 years until 1995. And that was part of Almaden Vineyard, which was one of the largest vineyards in the world. That was 6,000 acres total. So there is a history of grape growing here. Um, I was hired by the owner to implement an idea I threw out at a, at a conference. And that's, uh, and so we'll be discussing how that idea has basically came to, um, to develop. Um, this was the, this is the big question that has been driving me for a long time. And that is, is it possible to increase ecosystem health and resiliency to climate change while simultaneously maintaining or increasing profitability? Um, I got into farming as a kid when I was about probably around 14 years old and we had a small market farm in the outskirts of El Paso, Texas, mainly growing things like chili and corn and tomatoes and um, selling them at a little stand at the busiest intersection near our house. Um, and I, um, it was, it was, we basically were managing it conventionally until I developed a strong interest in falconry and raising raptors, which led me to reading Silent Spring and realizing that if I really wanted these birds to be around, um, we needed to figure out a different way to farm so that it wasn't um, destroying their ability to reproduce. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about soil health principles and how we apply those or practice those. And um, but first, I wanted to, one of one of those principles is, is is to have a context. And so this is the context for the vineyard project at Piscinus Ranch. We are also we're running. Uh, we have about we have a little over two thousand head of sheep on the ranch right now. We run cattle. Um, pigs, chickens, turkeys, and um, and then we have some crop ground too, about 600 acres of irrigated crop ground. Um, but this is, so this is the specific context for the, the, the vineyard. And um, basically it's a design project on how we um, design a vineyard that creates a flourishing ecosystem through mimicking um, healthy biological processes. And this would include, include maximizing photosynthetic capacity, soil health, plant, animal, and insect diversity, and then integration of grazing animals. The end result is to achieve exceptional quality wine, long-term profitability, 
a thriving ecosystem and resilience to climate change. Um, those of us in the wine world have been fully familiar with climate change for a long time. Grapes are very sensitive to changes in climate. Um, I think it was 20 years ago that I first heard about a conference on climate change in wine growing. So we've been looking at this for a while because we're working with a crop that is highly sensitive to, to changing climate. Um, just as an example, um, in this area, the harvest used to traditionally go until about Thanksgiving. And now generally people are done with harvest. So there's a, a number of grape varieties and they harvest at different times. Most people are done with harvest now about the middle of October. So we've moved, the entire harvest has moved up about a month. Um, so we, uh, the, the idea was again, how do we design th this, this system? And um, we have all these, uh, we basically created all these, these factors that we were designing for. And um, I'm not gonna read all of these to you because I, I think this will be av made available. Um, and if you want to see um, any of this stuff, um, you're welcome to contact us at Piscinus Ranch as well. But these are the these are the, the core the core things that we were looking for from a, a new design of a vineyard, and the problem is is that um, we tend not to have much design process in agriculture. If you think about it, you can get a degree in agricultural engineering, you can get a PhD in agricultural engineering, but as far as I know, there are no classes in agricultural design, which is kind of um, shows why we've gotten into an industrial um, uh, industrial mindset. This. Um, these are the soil health principles. Uh, some people have four, some people have more. Um, we are working with seven right now and we um, are always open to what might need to be added to this. So I think probably most of the people that are viewing this are familiar with these practices. One of the one that I, I find is increasingly important is the last one. If you're not working with people who believe that soil is the basis for productivity of both our agricultural and natural ecosystems. If somebody doesn't buy into that, then you can't really push a string. So working with people who are passionate about this is, and, and, and willing to, to, to discover and take that journey of how to make it work is really critical. And so this is um, those mountains in the background. Uh, we are right on the other side of those. So this is uh, the county uh, next to us, Monterey County. And this is what a lot of the vineyards over there look like. I think the average vineyard size is about a thousand acres. And at this time of year, which is probably, I would, I'm guessing this is going to be maybe, oh, let's say February, March. Um, you see that we have, it looks like they did put in a cover crop. It looks like one species and they skipped every other row. I still have not been able to find a good answer why people are doing that. Um, but anyway, it's, um, there's not a lot of diversity in this ecosystem. And it, uh, it's, it's, it's a stretch to call it an ecosystem. It's basically a, a very compromised former ecosystem. And so this is, um, this is not, the only inspiration that comes from me in seeing this is that we can do a lot better. And so my, my first attempt at this was to um, realizing again, the importance of integrating animals in, in, in cropping systems was to take a formally conventional uh, section out of a larger vineyard. Um, uh, so it was a large conventional vineyard. I took a small section out and did a trial running sheep in there throughout the growing season. Sheep are commonly grazed in vineyards in California during the non-growing season, which is our winter, which is also our wet season. And so that's when our cover crops are, are and the, the native vegetation is growing well, is basically from uh, in a normal year from say October through April. Um, so I just simply set an offset wire on here that enabled me to graze the vines without damaging the fruit or the, or the fruiting zone. And this was a trial I did, uh, probably it's been about 12 years ago. Um, this is uh, on, the, on, on the right side, you can see the, the trial vineyard. On the left side, you can see the control site. And one of the things that this, well, so we did several things here. We did not do, uh, all of the vegetation was controlled by the sheep grazing. And we were using a, 
pretty high density of sheep. And, and even though it was a very small vineyard, we were able to keep them pretty highly um, packed in there and move them frequently. On the control site, you can see that it was tilled. And if you want weeds, the best thing to do is till. So it's kind of a perpetual way to, to create weeds, which is funny that it's commonly used to control weeds. But so these are the same vines. These are the same vines, same variety, same clone. And on the side where I was managing it, uh, we didn't have to do any mowing. We didn't have to do any fertilizing. We didn't have to do any suckering. You can see those vines are really bushy at the bottom. Typically that has to be uh, removed by hand, either either by hand or by machine. And uh, the sheep did all that for us and um, converted that to dung and urine. And again, they also did the shoot tipping because when the vines got long, they hung down in the, in the rows and they were able to do that, which is another labor savings. So um, that was a good indicator that things were on the right path. Um, after doing presentations on that concept, mainly in Australia and New Zealand, and helping the first commercial vineyard uh, get set up in that system, which was in Australia, I started thinking, what if we, um, what if we actually bypassed the electrified system and created a vineyard that allowed us to graze throughout the growing season, but did a bunch of other things too, that we acknowledged the fact that things are getting warmer, things are getting hotter. How do we design for that? And how do we create a vineyard that is more resilient in the face of a changing climate? Um, the other things we wanted to do is make it easier to manage. Um, we wanted to make it more profitable by having sheep do as many of the tasks as possible. And we wanted to increase the overall biodiversity because if we don't have biodiversity, then we don't have resiliency. Um, so this was, um, this was the, um, this, I think this was actually last year. And this gives you an idea of the early on what, what our system looks like. We have a, uh, the vines are pretty tall. Um, we can walk under the, the vines as well as the sheep. And um, we can even, when we're first establishing and we can't have sheep in there because the vines are too small and they would eat them, we can mow those, th that vineyard going both directions. You can see we're keeping that vineyard floor covered throughout the year. Um, so this is the middle of our dry season, but we've still got good cover. Um, we have a canopy that partially shades the fruit and the vineyard. So we'll get about six, about half the vineyard is in complete shade during the, the hottest time of the afternoon. Um, we've never tilled, we, we've never tilled since we planted the vineyard. We did some, we did rip the vine rows on this section. The second section, we didn't even rip the vine rows. And this is a, um, this is a rendering of the a landscape architect did for us that was doing an internship here of what we wanted this to look like. And I was really happy that she said, do you want me to go below ground too? And I said, yeah, that would be great. Let's show the whole thing because we're managing, we're managing a whole ecosystem here. And so that's what, um, again, that's what we're working towards. Um, I wanna briefly talk about what is different about this from a conventional vineyard. And by conventional, it could be organic or, or biodynamic or, or just a, a conventional um, uh, management. And on the left there is what a normal VSP, which is called vertical shoot positioning, short for vertical shoot positioning vine would look like. And it's basically a hedge. And um, you can tell I have a really high budget for artistic work, <laughs> but um, the, uh, the vine on the right is, 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 is um, depicting what we're using here. And you can see that um, the, that we are actually able to capture more solar energy for photosynthesis. And we're also able to provide more shade because of this overhead canopy. And if you can imagine the, the one that's just the hedge, if that was the canopy like we're using, then you get a, a really good amount of shade, which is great for both workers. Um, right now, my crew is out there working. It's gonna be hundred degrees today. And so during the heat of the day, it's really nice to have some shade to work in. Um, so that's, um, it's, um, it's, it's kind of surprising that this particular trellis design was developed by a retired petroleum engineer in Texas, uh, just near Houston. And he, he didn't design it for sheep. He designed it because it's so hot and humid 
there that he wanted some type of canopy that was more open and but also had more shade. Um, this is just depicting um, the problem with grazing during the growing season of the vines, which is the summer. And if you're in a Mediterranean climate, this is just showing um, the two climates that I've worked in, the Mediterranean and the Southwest. The first vineyard that I put in and the first two that I designed were in Arizona. And you can see that the, um, the box, the, the brown box is showing when the sheep need to be excluded from the vineyard. Um, but it's also showing by the green humps when the moisture comes and when your floor vegetation, which could be native or, or cover crop or both, when that is at its peak. So in either of those scenarios, and then now, you know, there's, I think there's a bonded winery in every state in America, and they are growing, they're making uh, wine out of wine grapes and other fruits, but um, uh, you can probably grow wine grapes in just about every state in the union now as well. Um, some of those are hybrids, but um, in order to be to graze there during that that peak time of photosynthesis, um, you need to have a way to do that without damaging the vines. Um, this is a great uh, photo that I, I I use a lot, and this is just showing why it's so important to have animals integrated in livestock practices. Practices. This is from North Dakota. And this is a um, this is showing three types of management on the same type of soil. So all, all these soil samples were taken within 200 feet of each other, just different management practices. And the one on the on the left is uh, basically using holistic plant grazing, and you can see the soil structure there. You've got nice open pores um, and uh, a nice aggregate structure. Uh, the next one, the middle one, is continuous season-long grazing, which you still have the presence of animals. They're just not managed uh, probably quite as well as you could as you could be doing. They're left in there longer. There's probably some overgrazing happening and maybe some some trampling. But even with that, your soil structure is still better than the stuff that was the the, the far right, which was recently recently converted to cropland the year before. And um, and interestingly enough, that was a that was no till. So you can see that the soil degraded rapidly under that, um, under that practice. And the, um, the really fun part of this is they did a water infiltration test and the water infiltration rate uh, for the converted cropland for one inch took, uh, I believe it was somewhere around 31 minutes to, for an inch of water to soak into that soil. On the continuous season long grazing, it was, it took about, 11 minutes, so we're getting better. And on the well-managed grassland, it took seven seconds. So um, we are in an area where we want to, A, every drop of water that falls on the ground, we want it to go into the ground. And we, we have extremes. We have had the wettest year in California's recorded history. I've been here for eight years. That happened in 2017. And now we are in the, in the most serious drought since in the last 1800 years. So, um, so we have big extremes and we need to be able to have resiliency in the face of that. And the key for that is how we manage our soil. I'm gonna quickly go through how we developed the site. Um, this is the site where the vineyard was, the, the first phase we planted, it's a total of 25 acres. And um, we basically um, cleared the land, did a, 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 a an application of compost, a very thin application of compost. In that first year, we ran cattle on that. We had the equivalent of seven animal days per acre. We didn't plant a cover crop or um, do anything else. We just spread that compost and we allowed the native vegetation to come. So again, we got seven animal days per acre. The next year we planted a cover crop and our productivity went up tenfold. We had 70 animal days per acre. So we're already on this curve of increasing ecosystem health, starting with the soil and, um, and by the way, increasing our carrying capacity. So our potential um, for income is increasing at the same time. And we've not even planted a vineyard yet. Um, the next year we, we introduced sheep as well as cattle. And you can see our cover crop is, is still doing well. 
And then um, this is towards the end of that first year, we, um, we grazed it down, we put in our trellis stakes and we planted the vineyard. So that would be 2017. Um, I just wanted to give people a, an idea of what this looks like right now. These are some rams we raise, we run both Dorper, Dorper and Katahdin's. And uh, because of the fire, we picked up a big flock of, of Dorper. So our flock is mainly Dorper now. You can see the fruit up there. Um, this was probably in, uh, I'm thinking maybe early August or so. And again, we're, 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 we're actually strip grazing the vineyard as well. And you can see we have a, a two wire, two poly wires in there so we can divide it up in any direction. We don't just have to go up and down the rows. Um, so we, we, uh, because of the system, we're, we are able to graze year round and there's numerous benefits. I just wanted to show this photo because this is 1700 sheep on 12 acres. In that particular section, we grazed the entire 25 acres in a period of 24 hours. And it was, it's, it's really nice to have the option of going from anywhere from say five sheep to, to, um, to a large flock like this of, of about 1700. Um, so we have that option and we can use the sheep um, 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 at any time of the year. And it helps that we have this large um, let range land outside of the vineyard where we can take the sheep out of the vineyard and put them on there when we need to. This slide is just showing what happens when we do graze during the growing season. This was actually a couple of years ago. And in the foreground, you can see an area that has been grazed. And in the background is also another area that was been grazed. The part in the middle was not grazed because the, um, the vines were too small and we would have had to protect all the vines, which would have taken a lot of work. So until the vines get big, um, we, we, it's, 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 a, it's problematic to graze during the growing season because they will eat the leaves. They, they, they love grape leaves. And so if there's not too many vines, we, and actually this year we just developed a, a vine protector that works really well and is easy to set up and take down so that we can, we can it's, it'll be easier to graze the, the immature vineyard. Um, so I wanted to talk about, we, we believe in monitoring and we believe it is really important to monitor towards your context and to make sure that what you're doing is allowing you to achieve the results that you're after. Um, and so uh, we are monitoring for a wide variety of things, and I'm going to go over the results that, we, that have occurred from that. Um, the, one of the big ones is that soil organic matter has gone up by 1% um, before we actually got a crop. Last year was our first crop. So um, each 1% increase in soil organic matter here equates to about probably around 25,000 gallons of water holding increase in water holding capacity, which is about 36 gallons per vine. And that's a lot. Um, that's uh, over a month's worth of, of irrigation. And so if we can get, um, if we can get that up to about um, another percent or so, and we get a normal rainfall year, we, we think we'll be able to dry farm what, to, to, to grow the grapes without irrigation, or with a, at least a greatly reduced amount. Um, and there's obvious benefits besides water uh, retention. We're, we're sequestering that carbon in the atmosphere and helping to support a healthy um, soil ecosystem. Um, our inorganic nitrogen and sulfur are dropping. Um, we actually have high nitrates in our irrigation water. Um, so apparently that's, um, that's being uh, broken down and utilized. Um, we also have high salinity, uh, high salt levels, high sodium. Um, and those levels are dropping in spite of the fact that, again, we are in a drought. So usually the rainfall will help uh, flesh out some of those salts. But um, uh, apparently our soil biology is helping with that. Our calcium magnesium ratio is increasing, which is good because we have low calcium and high magnesium soils until you get into the subsoil where we have very high calcium. Boron is increasing and we have high boron in our water but um, the symptoms of toxicity have declined. We attribute that to our, um, our foliar spraying of, of calcium and also our soil health. 
and our microbial communities are become more complex and diverse. We're comparing them to, um, to some neighboring vineyards and we have 10% um, more bacteria and fungal species. And interestingly, they have more species of those organisms that, that thrive in soils that have been disturbed, that have been tilled. And we have a lot less because um, we don't have those conditions because we are not tilling. Um, we have order, over 46 plant species that grow in the understory. That includes both native plants, which are increasing, and the cover crops that we use. Um, a lot of the native plants that are coming in come in during the summer when we don't get rain and they're very drought tolerant and they can handle that. And um, a lot of those are great pollinator species too, like uh, milkweed is a big one. Um, we had an entomologist do the insect monitoring because we really, that was way out of our league. Um, and again, we're comparing that to a neighboring vineyard. We've got five times more um, insects than um, uh, our neighbor, and we've got a lot more um, predators and, and parasitoids. And um, the, the um, so as far as pesticides, we are certified organic and we are not using any pesticides and we rely on high bricks in our crops to prevent the, the, the sucking and chewing insects. Um, on the birds, we've got over 52 species and the vineyard is now considered an eBird hotspot. eBird is an international site for birders. And it, um, a lot of the folks that come, well, a fair amount of the folks that come to the ranch now, we have, we have uh, Airbnb rooms here. They come to um, check out the birds. Um, I alluded to the, to the bricks and the insects. And I just wanted to say that we are using uh, sap analysis and, and keeping our nutrient levels um, adequate on our vines so that that increases the vine health. And we did find that the bricks was highest in our vines where the sheep are grazing. And so that's a, we, we think that is a direct result of possibly two things, the, the dung in the urine and the, the contact of the sheep with the vines through the suckers and the shoot tips. Um, where the sheep are grazing, we've had bricks as high as 22. Um, where the sheep haven't grazed, we also have high bricks, but I think the highest we got there was about, uh, I believe it was 15.5. So um, that is, that is our, our program is to create health in the vines to reduce insect pests. Um, our estimated savings uh, through once we get everything established through using these processes is about $700 to $1,000 per acre. And that's because of reduced uh, labor inputs. Uh, tractor use has gone way down. Um, I see since we would never have managed a conventional vineyard here, um, the tractor use is basically just for the sprays. Um, and we do about seven of those a year. Um, uh, Unfortunately, in organic vineyards, you will tend to have even more tractor passes because of, of the tillage that is done. And so you can have as many as 25 tractor passes um, per row per year. Um, and this does not factor in that we, do, we have the likelihood of increased income from having sheep. Um, we did start an internship program last year, and this is uh, let's see, uh, one of these, the, the, the woman in the middle was in our internship program last year. So this is her second year. All of the others are new. And um, so uh, it's education is a big um, goal of ours. And it's one of the reasons I really appreciate what Green Cover is doing with all these series, which is a real, um, a real gift to the community. And so, um, um, we are, well, this has been an internship program. Next year, we'll probably increase it to a, a apprenticeship program. Um, not everything has, has gone perfect. Um, we lost, the first year we planted, we lost a third of the vineyard to squirrels. You can see that that is a squirrel tail as it's about to go into a grow tube. We thought the grow tubes would protect from squirrels, but they learned how to get into them. 
And we also lost a third of the vineyard to um, high rainfall in the nursery where the vines came from. They were underwater and consequently they, um, they never budded out. So between the squirrels and the flooding of the nursery, we lost two thirds of the vineyard the first year. But it's a, it's a constant learning process. And um, that's one of the reasons why education is important to us so we can share our learnings with others and help them avoid the, the mistakes that we've experienced. First wine from the vineyard was produced last year um, from this winery. We sell all of our grapes to local wine winemakers. And um, she sold out, the winemaker sold out of this, um, that, uh, that white wine, she sold out of it before it was even bottled. And then the, the, there was another white and a red that sold out within about a month. And they were the fastest selling wines from her portfolio. And she's doing a great job of also telling our story and, um, and partnering with us and being able to uh, expose people to these ideas in the wine world, as well as just the people who buy, buy wine. Um, I want to end with, a, with a, another thing that has been really important to us this year, and we're, we're talking about our monitoring, but biodiversity is really critical to us. Um, with uh, agriculture in general tends to really destroy biodiversity. I mean, we, we clear land and we, we tend to reduce it to just a, a couple crops. Um, our goal is to do the opposite, to actually use agriculture to restore biodiversity and, and set things right with the world again. Um, this is a, what's called a tricolored blackbird, pretty similar to a, to a red-winged blackbird, which a lot of folks are probably familiar with. And this is um, a uh, endangered species. It's endemic to California, and it tends to, it, it was very uh, common in the Central Valley, but has been reduced mainly because of agricultural practices. Um, and they are an insect eater. And every now and then we would get a few on the ranch and they, their, their call sounds like a, it sounds like a, a cat uh, kind of meowing and kind of a, a, with a rough voice. And we're, we always get excited when we see a couple because they're, they're endangered and it's just fun to have some biodiversity. Well, this year, um, they, 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 we would see a couple more each day until it was getting obvious that there was a, a, a big influx of them. So I called a neighbor who's a retired bird guide and told her that we had what I thought was hundreds. And she said, oh, you probably just don't know how to count. <laughs> so she came out and she said, wow, according to my count, you've got about 800 in this flock here. And so they would come up to the vineyard every day and they would go through the outside of the vineyard in the morning and then come into the vineyard in the afternoon. And I wanna show folks a slide of what this looked like, if I can, if this will work for me. This is right on the outside of the vineyard. And again, this is an endangered species in California. And we had, at one time we had up to 3000, they nested just right below where this video was, was taken. And um, we, were, um, we were pretty excited about that as were actually a lot of folks in California. The, the, the California state expert on tricolors came out here. And one of the first things people asked was, why are they in the vineyard? You guys must have a lot of insects and we do. And so apparently that created habitat suitable for them to be here. And we're really excited that our practices allowed habitat and food for an endangered species. So in addition to getting a crop of wine grapes and sheep, we are also creating habitat for, for wildlife, which is really, again, critical. And it just, it, they're partners, they, they actually don't eat, they're, they're just insect eaters, so they don't, they don't eat fruit. But um, we're um, again. That's part of our um, part of our mission. And this uh, second year of of growing grapes, we're seeing some pretty good indicators that we're on the right track. I just wanted to show this slide of of from uh, Buckminster Fuller, um, and which kind of highlights the importance of design, and that um, 
if you keep trying to fight the existing reality, um, you're just in a fight that's, that's, that's going to go on forever. And I got inspired by this. Just if you want to, if you want to change the way things work, then create a model that makes the old model obsolete. And um, we are just in the early stages of this. We have a lot to learn, but I just heard a, a, a week ago that there's already one of these being used in Australia now because of a, a guy that was visiting here and um, have a, a, a several other folks that are interested in, in, in doing this as well. So again, it's, it's more than just a, a, the vineyard design. You could, you could do this with a number of, of trellis systems, but it's the, it's, it's the practices and the processes that we're paying attention to that allow nature to, to flourish again and be partners with us on what we're doing here. Um, I'm, again, I'm not gonna read all these, but these are, these are uh, some of the farming principles that we work with here in addition to the soil health principles. And all of these should be available on this um, uh, uh, site and they're available on our website as well. Um, and this is my contact information. And, uh, uh, and then I think uh, we're going to open up for questions here. So I will turn it over to Keith and Davis. Yeah, great, Kelly. That's. Uh... Really inspiring. I had tons and tons of questions and thoughts and everything else kind of going through my head. I, lo I love that that last quote by Buckminster Fuller of you know to change something you got to you got to build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And you know, so my first question would be: It certainly looks like you've done that with this new model of vineyards and integration of the of the sheep and you know all the biological benefits that's coming from that. Do you have a lot of people coming to you? to try to integrate this into their own operations. And, and before I let you answer that, I, I do want to just put in a plug for, for the Piscinus Ranch and the Piscinus Group that, that you guys are really, you're, you're set up to, to do this and to, you know, to make a profit doing this, but, but you're really set up as a learning organization too. You've got an entire division of Piscinus that is totally dedicated to learning. Uh, I think there's a separate website for Piscinus Learning. So uh, I would encourage people to go and check that out. I've been there. Davis has been there. We've really put on some quality educational type things. But Kelly, I'm interested, you know, are there a lot of people coming to you to try to learn this, to, to be able to expand this out into their uh, operations? Uh, yes, the interest has picked up pretty dramatically in this, um, in this past year. I think in part because um, the wine writer for the New York Times came out and he did a, um, a piece on what we were doing. And that was spawned by a neighbor who um, I'd actually done some consulting work for a while back uh, named Randall Graham, who used, to, who used to have his own winery that was a, a pretty famous one. And um, he came out to visit what we were doing and he tweeted and he had 600,000 followers or something. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden and I, I, I actually am not on, any social media, so it was my it was my crew told me, hey, there's a there's a, a little bit of a buzz going on, so the um, there there is interest, and unfortunately, um, our current management practices in California in general mean that the life of a vineyard is only about twenty years, and we have things like red blotch and Pierce's disease, and just um, I would say a lot of the conventional management is hard on the vines. But uh, I had a guy who is at, having to take out 60 acres because of problems and he came out to visit and it took him a while to find me in the vineyard. And by the time he caught up with me, he said, I actually don't even need to meet with you. I see what you're doing here. And I, I'm excited that I actually have to rip out my vineyard now because this is, this, is what I, this is what I'm going to do. And I see all of the advantages that are, come, that are gonna come from this, from the shade He's from a hotter growing region than us, from the shade to being able to have a, another revenue stream with the sheep and just the ease of management of something like this. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you for not only helping to build that model, but being so willing to share it with others to, to learn as well. That's, that's great. Uh, Karen is asking a great question here. She says, uh, can you kind of go back and revisit that part that you were talking about, about water retention and specifically kind of where you're at? 
And because what you said is rather shocking that you think that there may be a possibility that you could do dry land grapes in that part of California once you get your soil built up enough. And, and just, just kind of touch on that point again, because I agree with Karen that that's a really great point. And people that aren't familiar with the environment you have in California, that is a super shocking statement. Yes. And so um, before we went into this drought, um, we actually had some old, old vines here. So some of them were um, so anywhere from 70 to, um, to over 100 years old. Oh, actually, over 100, probably over 130 years old. Some of the oldest vines in the state, probably. So um, and s both of those sites had been dry farmed. Um, I think in the past couple of years, they've had to actually do a little bit of irrigating. So dry farming. Um, is possible with, and, and those, those are against the mountain there. So they're probably getting a little bit more rain than we do, but dry farming is possible. I've, when I was in Australia the first time and I was just visiting growers, um, I, I met somebody who was dry farming and he said that he could, he could pull off a crop with six inches. It probably wouldn't be economically viable. And the, 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 that was in a Mediterranean climate. So it's just winter rainfall. Um, so I'm thinking again, if we build up our soil organic matter, which started out at about one to one and a half percent. So it wasn't much, but if we can build that up and we have, we do have clay in our soil as well, then I don't think it will be that big of a stretch given um, a normal rainfall year to be able to drive from that. It will also, it, um, it, it could be a little bit tricky since we've established the vines using irrigation. If you establish them with dry farming techniques, I think the, 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 the roots tend to go down. They have to go down in order for those vines to survive. So um, we might have to wean them off of that, but I think that it will be very possible. And again, I, I think a lot of folks don't realize how how much the water holding capacity, the water holding capacity of carbon is. And that is a sponge, basically. And so the more of that we can get in there, the better. But in addition, we're, we're, we're adding the factor of keeping the ground covered throughout the year. Historically, dry farming in California was done with a dust mulch, so which is basically turning the top six inches of your soil into tilling it pretty severely until it is more or less a dust and or really fine particles. And then that is acting as a as a it's kind of a mulch itself. Um, we are, we are, since we're not doing tillage and we don't, we, I, I, I can't imagine ever doing that to our soil. Um, uh, we think that uh, we are also developing a, perhaps a, a, more, um, a more soil sympathetic uh, way of dry farming. Very good. Uh, Felix is, uh, first of all, Felix says, great job, Kelly, very impressed with that you've done there. He's interested in kind of your trellis dimensions. And, and I know that in visiting with you, you know, you talked about the, the, the taller trellis height is not only good to keep that away from the sheep, but grapes naturally want to grow a little taller than what most people are training them to do. If you can just talk a little bit about how high that is and maybe how much that spread is on your, on your arches. Okay, yeah, that's a that's a great question. Getting into into the details about this system. Um, first off, our, our row spacing is uh, is twelve feet apart, so twelve feet between vine rows, and six feet apart between vines. Another thing to just go back to the dry farming real quick is historically dry farming was planted at ten by ten or twelve by twelve spacing, which allowed a big area for the root zone for the vines. Most vines in California are planted at probably um, uh, twice the density that we are planting. But um, we wanted to allow additional space so that we could take advantage of all the uh, rainfall and, and have more likelihood of, of being able to dry farm. So, but that is a, that's the, that's the traditional, um, uh, so the, and this is the Watson system that we're using is, is, is primarily used in Texas and Georgia. And, in general, it is spaced six by 12, maybe six by 11. Um, and this, the trellis system is our fruiting zone is on, so that's the cordon wire, that's the top wire. And that is at 
about 66, probably averages 66 inches, anywhere from 66 to 68. Um, and that will allow us to run just about any breed of sheep under there. So we didn't want something that was just specific to a smaller breed. We wanted it to be conducive to just about any breed of sheep. Um, the V is four feet across. And when the vines, so the vines are divided at the cordon wire. So they come up, they split like a T and then they split like a V and go over into either side of the row. And when they are fully taken advantage of that, they will extend probably a foot beyond the, the four feet um, of the trellis. And so that will take up about six feet of every of the of 12 feet of every uh, of the of the 12 feet of every row which gives half of it in shade um, because we are using um, wider spacing i would say that the cost is going to be pretty similar to a, a conventional vsp system because they it takes more hardware more more in posts and um, grape stakes and wire than the watson does so, but we are using a little bit taller posts and the Vs. So I think it would probably be pretty similar in cost um, to, to, to set up either of these, but in labor, ours would take a little bit less labor because there's less posts to pound in. Yeah. Really good. that system, you said it was developed in Houston, um, high humidity, you're in a very arid environment um both probably have heat taken care of but uh where where does that system not work is that one that could be more of a are you suggesting should be more of a universal uh system with the with the spacing with the height um if it's covering a broad range of geography already are there limits to it um th there 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 would be um and so one thing that could be a factor is severe wind. Um, and if you could only go one direction, we were able to, all, all of the rows are, are set up so that the prevailing wind goes basically up the row. It doesn't go against the vines, in which case it could potentially flop everything over to one side. Um, so that could be a, a bit of a problem. And then I think there's probably some of the hybrid vines that are grown in the Northeast where um, uh, you don't need that much canopy from them. And so uh, uh, a lot of them just have two wires and, um, and, and some of them would even just be a single wire. So that would be overkill for something like that, where you would just, you could just get by with maybe one wire. Now, if you wanted to graze, maybe it would be a, maybe you would have a little bit of a V on there, but not to the extent that we're using. It might just have one wire on either side to help keep stuff out of reach of the sheep. Of sheep. Um, sure. But otherwise, um, and it, it would be possible too if you were in a really cold climate and you needed to be close to the earth to, um, to take advantage of the heat of the soil during the summer and that extended heat that goes into the fall to keep from, from frosting, that would be another uh, reason why you might not want to have something that tall. Do, do you have any uh, pushback from your workers on harvesting those higher trellises or does that not seem to be a problem? No, actually, um, everybody so far really likes that. Um, there are, we, we do have a lot of folks from Oaxaca and Guatemala that work vineyards in this area. And some of those folks are, are not very tall. <laughs> and I, they, they said, oh, that, that, would be, that would be a lot of trouble. But in general, um, in general, when you're picking, you're, you're stooping down. Yeah. And so I think that, um, I know last year when we did our harvest, everybody was really excited about being able to stand upright and pick fruit at eye level. Sure. So um, that in that regard, that's, that's, that's yeah. good. So Tiffany has a question, uh, and, and I'll let you weigh in on this. And Davis, you can maybe comment on what you've seen in other places as well. But what, what, are, what seeds are you using for the annual portion of the cover crop that you're drilling in there? You've got some perennial, native perennials coming back as part of that mix. But what kinds of things are you planting? Okay, so um, we are, some of our, kind of our core mix tends to be oats. Um, and I have also done 
barley, triticale, and wheat. Um, but oats is and oats is oats is one of my favorite of the of the of the grasses, and it's it's one of the favorite of the sheep as well. Oats and barley are both good uh, sheep feed. And then I will um, I had started initially using a lot of radish, but I'd heard that there can be issues with the radishes uh, affecting the flavor of wine grapes. So I've switched over to using a lot more chicory, which does well in this climate. And I actually really like the chicory, and that's a good a good uh, good forage for the sheep as well. Um, and I'll throw in some seeds, uh, some flower seeds like Facelia, California poppy. I also like to use um, Lana Vetch, um, Crimson Clover. Um, and then I've lately started collecting native flower seeds from the ranch and throw those in the mix as well to try and encourage some of the native diversity and some of the native uh, vegetation, um, in part because we have a lot of pollinator insects here that are specific to specific plants. So having those plants growing, I think, will be beneficial to us. So our seed, our seed mix is, is, can be pretty diverse. Um, we've had, I think, up to maybe probably 20 different species in there, some of which we're adding and some of which we're just purchasing. Yeah. Davis, any, any comments on what some of the other vineyard folks in that area maybe have had some success with as well? Yeah, I think the termination time is really important to point out there. So with, with Kelly's context, uh, having a variety of maturing plants is really helpful if we're talking about grazing sheep over a certain duration. If, um, if a, another grower was trying to get as much biomass produced from that cover crop before they terminate at a certain time, before maybe they have to start other operations, they would maybe have to focus a little bit more on the earlier maturing options. So maybe a little bit more barley, a little bit more rye, potentially faba beans I've seen do really well in addition to the other species Kelly mentioned. So that's something that I like to um, ask about is just when they're going to be terminating the cover crop, how they're going to be terminating the cover crop. Uh, another pro for Kelly's system is not really having to terminate the cover crop. You're trying to produce good feed. And so uh, that's not as much a concern for him. In fact, it's, uh, yeah, with that system, we're trying to, again, just extend the maturity of, of the entire cover crop. I want to ask one more question and then I'll turn it over to Davis. He can ask a, a few additional ones here. And I know we'll run a little bit past our hour, but Kelly, as long as you've got a few more minutes, I think we can extend this out just a bit. I wanted to go back and touch uh, on, on something that you said, because again, it's, it's, it's a really big number uh, when it comes to bricks. You know, you said that you were measuring 22 mm -hmm. bricks levels with your grazing around 15 without grazing. Can you talk at all about what a conventional vineyard might have without any of these practices that you're doing? And then just kind of put that into context for people about how big of a deal that is and, and how that is really preventing you from needing insecticides. And I'm guessing maybe even fungicides, you're, you're pretty well eliminated because the bricks is an indication of how healthy that plant is. But do you have any idea what, what your neighboring vineyards, you know, like the one on the other side of the mountains that you showed would be? Um, that's a great point, um, Keith. And I don't think that we have tested bricks at, at, at any of the neighbors, but I'm going to, um, I'm going to have the, our, our guy here, Greg, who's been uh, doing that monitoring stuff. Uh, I'm going to have him do that and uh, compare it on, you know, within, within like 15 minutes or so the bricks here mm -hmm. at, at neighboring vineyards. But um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure actually with, we've, we've just been testing within our own vineyard and um, I will say that um, that is, so we've had the range from uh, all the way up to 22 with, with where the sheep were grazing. And I think our lowest bricks was about 13.5. Um, and if you, if you listen to folks like John Kempf and um, others who are talking nice. about bricks, um, then anything be kind of above 14 or 15, and you basically 
are, are out of the zone, um, you, you, the, 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 the plant material has become undigestible to, to insects. Mm -hmm. And so um, that is, that's something that we, I mean, we would look at forage uh, bricks just to see how, how nutritious it was, but it, really this idea of looking at bricks as a way of preventing insect damage. And we are, um, we, we are so again, we are certified organic, but I don't like to even use our organic fungicides, which tend to be sulfur and oil are the main two that we have used in the past. But um, this year we did use one oil application um, and which is way down from like doing, I don't know, maybe at least half of half a dozen um, applications for, um, for, fun, for, for fungal disease. And last year we didn't have to do any oil um, sprays on the vines that we harvested fruit off of. So we are, um, we're getting closer to that point. And I think that it's gonna be a combination of canopy management and vine nutrition. Yeah, and, and if people aren't familiar with the BRICS test, it's a, it's a relatively easy, super cheap test to do. Uh, anybody can do it and you can do it in real time. And so it's, it's really a great way to test your, it, it can be any crop, you know, grapes, but it could be corn, beans, anything that you're growing, you can get a BRICS test. But, but I think what Kelly is demonstrating here is the power of these principles of soil health. When you're not applying any of them, my guess is that BRICS level is below 10 a lot. When you're applying most of them, you're getting, you know, to that, that 13, 14, 15, which is above that threshold. But when you're putting them all together, 22 is incredible. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's just that's, fantastic. I saw David that, nodding his head because he knows how impressive that is. That's actually higher, uh, higher bricks in our sap than, than, than the winemaker wanted in the wine grapes. So that's, that's, that's kind of funny. Probably makes too sweet of a wine. Yeah. So uh, Davis, I'm going to turn it over to you. You can ask the last few questions and then kind of wrap it up here. Sure. So Kelly, you... You showed the picture of the squirrel. That's a common question. Uh, squirrels or at least other types of rodents. Uh, was there anything that you did to alleviate that issue uh, or do you still have to do anything to treat that issue? Yeah, it's, it's funny. So that was uh, one of the wettest years we've had and we had a big squirrel infestation and now we're in our driest year and we've also had a big squirrel. So they're definitely opportunistic, whatever way the, the, the climate's going, they're gonna take advantage of it. Um, and so we do, we do live trapping. Um, we do, we've tried a little bit of, of trapping with um, a, a kill trap, but that hasn't been too successful. And I have been shooting a lot of squirrels as well. And we have some, we have a handful of retired guys who come onto the ranch to shoot squirrels just because they want to. So we have a volunteer um, uh, uh, predator posse. And I think one of the problems is, is that um, we have reduced or eliminated a lot of the predators for ground squirrels. I think a big one was uh, literally was a grizzly bear. And I've heard stories of grizzly bears basically just getting into a squirrel den and popping out the, the squirrels and eating them like popcorns. <laughs> And we don't, you know, there's grizzly bears have been gone for a long time. So unfortunately we have to become the predator in order. And, you know, we're managing for, 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 for diversity and, and, and ecological health. And so obviously all, all the animals are gonna try and take advantage of that. It's just that the predators tend to be behind the, the, the prey animals and, and as far as their, um, their life building up numbers. Sure. Now, another common question that we get is what to do right under the vine row or in the vine row. Um, so cover crop focusing on in between vine rows, but what to do right under the vine row. It seems like as we listen to your system and see the pictures of what you're doing, that that's really an irrelevant question <laughs> by the time you are running sheep through it. Uh, are you noticing any reduction in vine vigor or are there any cons to uh, not doing anything in the vine row like other people might be doing to control weeds right around the vine? Um, last night I was doing a little spraying of, um, of a, 
a foliar spray of it was kelp and um, uh, kelp and calcium and a fish hydrolysate. And so it was just to give them a little bit of a boost. And, and sometimes the young vines do show symptoms of the, um, of the boron toxicity more than an older vine. So I was, um, I was, I was doing that spray and, um, and the, the, the one thing that can be a problem is if you have weeds around a young vine and can't access it for a spray like that. But the thing I also noticed is when the vine, when the, when the weeds do well, the vines do well. And so it's pretty rare that I have weeds overpowering a vine. In general, the, the vines kind of shoot up through the weeds and are doing pretty good. Okay. But um, and that has, yeah, we've, we've, uh, when we first do grafting and things like that, where we, we, the grafters need to get in and, and that area needs to be clear, then we'll remove weeds. Otherwise, um, we don't really worry about them um, and we don't really have that much trouble. And again, as, um, as I'd mentioned, um, the, um, the, the, the weeds can actually, they, they're, they're working in a different zone than the grapevines. Grapevines can be very deep rooted. And so I think that the weeds may actually help drive the roots down deeper. Wow. And, and when I'm, I'm, I'm calling them weeds because that's what people refer to them. As. Understood. We, 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 we call them resources. Right. Forage. Yeah, I like that. Now I've got two more questions for you that are a little bit more bigger picture. We've talked to, about a few technical questions, but one of the things that I think makes you really unique is how talented you are at making the livestock system fit with the cropping system. Uh, we've got all sorts of producers who are commonly raising livestock and raising crops, but you have created such dramatic synergy from the two of them together. Do you have any advice for our growers who are livestock producers as well as uh, crop producers and just how to be thinking even deeper about creating the synergy like you have? Yeah, I think uh, we have to put aside our limitations and thinking that it has to be a certain way. Um, and it, I mean, it's, to me, it was pretty funny to get so much resistance from, from folks who've been growing grapes for all their lives um, to be really concerned about raising the vines up higher. And, um, and when, as, as anybody who's seen vines growing in the wild, I mean, that I, where I, the first vineyard I put in in Arizona, there was a vine growing on a tree. I could not see the top of the tree and the vine was growing all the way to the top of the tree. And so um, uh, they, they definitely have, that's their habitat. And um, so um, I think oftentimes the things that limit us are the things that we know. And so we have to get beyond this, this, this narrative that um, we can only do it a certain way. And I think that goes, that's gonna go for all types of cropping systems. And in, in I, I, previous to doing the, the wine grapes, I was doing um, vegetable crops, growing 60 different types of vegetable crops in Colorado. And we were integrating livestock into those. Um, but we were doing that the year before and then having the, the winter rest. And that allowed us to, to do that with virtually no inputs and produce really high quality. And so, but I, I had this, and that was under a center pivot. And I had to think again, outside the box of how am, how am I going to set this up and make this work? Um, and I think that um, oftentimes the things that where we get stuck or the, because of the things we know and we need to free ourselves up to think outside the box. I love that. Last question for me anyway, is this system, uh, you have listed off benefit after benefit. I mean, it is just in incredible. What's left for you on this journey? What's left to figure out in this system? Uh, and assuming that there might be a few other things to figure out, uh, what things are you really trying to observe um, this season or, or right now? Well, we, as I said, we we're just scratching the surface, and I would like to um, I would like to really see in our monitoring the biodiversity go way up. I would like to see our soil health go up to the point that we have to that our outside inputs, just our foliar sprays, which 
I mean, by volume, it's tiny amounts of stuff that we're putting on, but um, uh, getting our soil biology to a state that it's providing everything that the vine needs. And so we don't have to do those foliar sprays. Um, and, um, and looking at ways, again, that we increase the <clears throat> plant biodiversity, as well as um, uh, one of the things that's kind of biting us a little bit now is we have really high bird numbers um, through most of the year. And <clears throat> I think those birds, when we shut, start putting cannons out in the vineyard to, to, during the harvest, just before harvest are kind of used to the us and they get used to our cannons. And I think that makes the birds that do eat the grapes say, well, if those birds are in there, it must not be too bad. And so um, we, we will probably have to net everything next year, which is, which in, in, in the long run is probably better than shooting off cannons and, 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 and doing all that stuff. So, um, but I think that it's, that again, that, I, we, I, I don't think we know what the potential is with something like this and how much, how much increase in biodiversity can we achieve and what does that look like? And then how do we do that with our other cropping systems as well? So, um, and then of course, how do we get more and more people to adopt this? And, um, and now the thing that I wanna see is we have multiple winemakers this year and there, there's gonna be a lot of expressions of the fruit and um, I would really like in, in the wine world, the winemakers are the are the are the um, are the big shots. Nobody ever talks about the, the wine growers, but I think that um, that if uh, for, for one thing, it's going to make it a lot more interesting for younger folks to get into something like this because it's a it's a it's a, it's a different way of thinking about things, and it's, it's um, I think is a lot more interesting. And so I think that. Um, it'll be fun to see um, vineyards getting more of the acknowledgement for creating quality wine, but not just quality wine. I mean, if you can buy a wine that is restoring ecosystem health, um, you've got, you can feel good at multiple levels about that. Absolutely. Well, I quote you all the time. I, I understand now that um, you were probably channeling Buckminster Fuller when you said this, but you mentioned, uh, you mentioned to me on one of my trips out that some people are looking at regenerative practices and trying to figure out, oh, I like this practice. I want to put this into my operation. And while that's, while that's good, uh, sometimes the whole system needs to be redesigned. And so I'm um, Constantly challenged by that. I think that's really uh, an important note and something that we all need to be thinking about. So I uh, appreciate your inspiration and your education to us all with that. Well, thank you. Sophie, anything else for Kelly or, or Kelly, anything else for the audience? Um, I'll just say thank you, Kelly. This has been a super informative webinar. I've been taking tons of notes this entire time and learning a lot. So it's been really awesome. Um, just a quick note about next week's webinar. We are going to be talking about um, wine again. So we're continuing the theme. Um, Joseph Brinkley from Bonterra Organic Estates is going to be on next week. Same time, Tuesday at 12 o'clock Central Standard Time. And you guys can register for that webinar if you haven't already on our webinars page, which is just greencover.com slash webinars. Thanks, Kelly. And then I, I do have one thing I'd just like to mention. If people are interested in getting on our website and, and um, uh, signing up to be notified of our workshops, um, we do, we do, and we are kind of coming out of COVID now and doing more and more workshops. And so you can go on there and just sign up. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, guys. Take yeah. care. You too. Bye. Bye.